Mr. Durbin. Mr. Durbin. Aye. Ms. Stabenow. Ms. Stabenow. Aye. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cornyn. No. Mr. Blunt, Mr. Blunt, aye.
Are there any members wishing to vote or change their vote? If not, uh, the yeas are 74, the nays are 16. Nomination is confirmed. Under the previous order, the motion to reconsider is considered made and laid upon the table. The President will be immediately notified of the Senate's action, and the Senate will resume legislative session. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. <clears throat> Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent. The Senate proceed to appear to point business, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Without objection. Mr. President, I won't take to... Could I kindly ask uh, uh, the assistant uh, leader... Oh. If Senate will be in order. Senate will be in order, please. Senator from Texas. Here, I'd like to ask the assistant leader if the, uh, just as a matter of accommodation, I know we have two uh, speakers on the Republican side, two speakers on the Democratic side. Is there, would you be a, a, uh, amenable to entering in an order that locking in the order in which people are speaking, go back and forth, or the like? And if we could have some, uh, some suggestion about the time for each. I know Senator Wyden and Senator from Oregon, please. Moran. Senator from Oregon. Mr. President, uh, I think what Senator Cornyn has asked for is very reasonable. Senator Moran and I, who have teamed up on this question of Internet policy, would each like to speak for a, a few minutes if we could follow each other. Uh, we were planning to be brief. I know the Senator from Illinois is going to be brief, if that would be acceptable to the, the Senator from, uh, from Texas. What is it, Mr. Mr. President, I'd ask just uh, whether the Senator from Texas, Senator from Illinois, would agree that following his comments, that I be uh, up to 10 minutes, that I be recognized for 10 minutes, and then back and forth. Senator from Illinois. Uh, here's what I'd like to suggest to the Senator from Texas. Senator Wyden and Senator Moran had already asked for time. I have asked for three minutes to speak about our colleague, Senator Kirk. That's all. I want to make a reference to him, and then turn it over to them. I will not speak at length. And then after they have spoken, and I don't know if you'd like to suggest a time. Mr. President, I think both of us were thinking about five or ten minutes each. We were going to be very brief. And then, of course, back to your side. Is that fair? That's fine. Thank you, Mr. President. Okay. Without objection. Mr. Senator President. from Illinois. Mr. President, we've been gone for six weeks or so, and it's great to see our colleagues back here. And a lot of things have been exchanged about what we did back home during this break. But the focal point of most conversations on the floor this evening has been rightfully about uh, my colleague from Illinois, Senator Mark Kirk. Most everyone knows now that uh, he suffered a stroke over the weekend and uh, underwent surgery last night at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago. Uh, all I know about this, virtually all of it, comes from a press conference that his surgeon gave today in Chicago. Uh, all of us want to make it clear to Mark that he's in our thoughts and our prayers, and his family is as well. Uh, we all feel, to a person, that he will make a strong recovery. He is young. He is in good condition. He prides himself on his service in the Naval Reserve and stays fit to, to serve our country in that capacity as well as in the United States Senate. He is, has a tough, steep hill ahead of him, but he is up to the task. And if the encouragement from a Democrat as well as many Republicans is, uh, is what is needed, he has it. Uh, I just want to let you know that uh, if, he, if the word is passed along to him in his recovery, that his colleagues in the United States Senate were focusing on his quick recovery and are anxious for him to return. Mr. President, I yield the floor. President, uh, Senator from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. President. I think uh, Senator Durbin speaks for every member of the Senate. Such a decent caring and thoughtful man and all of us have so enjoyed working with Senator Kirk during his time in, in the Senate. We can relate various ki kinds of bills but Godspeed Senator uh, Kirk to a healthy uh, recovery. We are thinking of you tonight and you're in our prayers and uh, I'm very glad uh, the senior senator from Illinois reflected the concerns of everybody from his home state uh, tonight. Mr. President, I want to take just a few minutes uh, with Senator Moran tonight to reflect on the events of the uh, last few days with respect to the Internet legislation. And I want to begin by thanking Majority Leader uh, Harry Reid for reopening the debate on anti-counterfeiting and copyright protection legislation. In pulling the Protect IP Act from the floor, 
Leader Reid has given the United States Senate an opportunity to get this policy right. The Senate now has the opportunity to consult all of the stakeholders, including the millions of Internet users who were heard last week. The Senate has the opportunity to ensure that those exercising their First Amendment rights through the Internet, those offering innovative products and services, and those looking for new mediums for sharing and expression have their voices heard. I also want to express my appreciation to Senator Moran. He is an impassioned advocate for job creation and innovation on the net. The first uh, on the other side of the aisle to join me uh, in this uh, cause. My colleague, Senator Cantwell from Washington State, who is as knowledgeable as anybody in public service about technology, and Senator Rand Paul, who is a champion of the Internet as a place where those uh, who look at the net as a marketplace of ideas can stand uh, together and approach policy in an innovative way. Mr. President, last week, tens of millions of Americans, empowered by the Internet, affected political change here in Washington. The Congress was on a trajectory to pass legislation that would change the Internet as we know it. It would reshape the Internet in a way, in my view, that would have been harmful to our economy, our democracy, and our national security interests. And when Americans learned about all this, they said no. The Internet enabled people from all walks of life to learn about the legislation and then take collective action to urge their representatives in Washington to stop it. And so everybody asked, come Wednesday, what would happen? And in fact, the American people stopped this legislation. Their voices counted more than all the political lobbying, more than all of the advertising, more than all of the phone calls that were made by the heads, the executives of the movie studios. Their voices were heard loud and clear. Last week, the Congress did what the American people called for instead of what the Washington insiders wanted. That's what I call real change. It was a grassroots victory for the history books. And as one commentator said, now we are in unexplored territory. Here's why. Eight million of the 162 million that visited Wikipedia took action to influence their member of Congress. Seven million Americans signed Google's petition to block consideration of PIPA. Hundreds of thousands of Americans called the Congress. In all, in just one day, more than 15 million Americans communicated with the Congress and urged it to reject the Hollywood proposal to censor and censure the Internet. The 15 million Americans that took action, who signed the petitions, who provided their email address, a zip code, and a desire to be informed, they are now going to be watching us like never before. The 15 million that looked up and spoke, they're not faceless and they're not anonymous. They are people like Francis Stewart of Maryland, Nancy Linton from Oregon, and Debbie Kearns from East Hartford, Connecticut, and John Jewett of Colorado, who gave their names to websites around the country. They're joined by millions of other Americans that were raising concerns for months before last week's web blackout and support the filibuster that I announced here in the United States Senate, Mr. President, almost a year and a half ago. These 15 million citizen activists were not the only ones saying the Protect IP Act took the wrong approach. The New York Times and the Los Angeles Times the hometown newspapers, Mr. President, for the content industry both wrote editorials saying that the le legislation overreached. I would ask unanimous consent, Mr. President, that copies of those articles be made a part of the record. Without objection. Mr. President, while the 15 million are it, no doubt pleased, as I am, that Majority Leader Reid pulled PIPA, they are waiting to see if we now retrench into the old ways of doing things the old way, where senators go behind closed doors and write legislation with the help of well-heeled lobbyists. The old way that has eroded the trust that America has with the Congress and the confidence that we are here on their behalf. Or will the Congress instead construct legislation in a transparent way that responds 
to our broad collective interests. The American people want just that, and they deserve it. Among the lessons we should have learned from the events of the past few weeks is the importance of letting the public in on what we're doing. There are serious unintended consequences when members of Congress and staff think they have all the answers and rush to construct and pass legislation. There are clear virtues in prudence, deliberation, and even a little humility. I believe that's what our constitutional framers had in mind for the United States Senate. Mr. President, I know my colleagues are waiting, and I want to close with this. I harbor no doubt, Mr. President, that this Congress, on a bipartisan basis, can and should construct legislation to combat international commerce and counterfeit merchandise and content that infringes on copyrights. There is no question that selling fake Nikes or movies you don't own is a problem that needs to be addressed. But it can be done in ways that do not threaten speech, that allow for the legitimate sharing of information and protect the architecture and value of the Internet. I look forward to working with my colleagues in a broad cross-section of stakeholders to do that. I have proposed an alternative with Senator Moran and Senator Cantwell here in the Senate. Chairman Issa, uh, Congresswoman Lofgren have proposed exactly that kind of alternative in the House. It's called the Open Act. It is bipartisan. It is bicameral. It would allow us to go after the problem of these rogue foreign uh, websites while at the same time protecting what we value so greatly about the Internet. So, Mr. President, we're going to have more discussions about this legislation and other approaches in the future, but we now have an opportunity to get this right. To a great extent, that is possible because of my colleague from, uh, from Kansas, uh, who's joined me in this effort, the first on the other side of the aisle to step up and join uh, our efforts. I'm very appreciative of what he has done and look forward to his comments. Mr. President, with that, I yield the floor. Also, thank the senator from, uh, from Texas, uh, Senator Cornyn, for his courtesy. So, Senator Moran and I, because of our bipartisan uh, work, could make these brief remarks. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Kansas. Mr. President, thank you. Uh, I appreciate so much the remarks of the senator from Oregon, uh, Senator Wyden. It was a, it was a significant moment in my uh, brief time as a member of the United States Senate when uh, three months ago Senator Wyden and I had a conversation here on the Senate floor uh, about this legislation, uh, about PIPA and about SOPA and about the open internet and uh, it was uh, a moment in which uh, Senator Wyden found me looking for ways in which I could be engaged in the, the process of trying to create an environment in which entrepreneurship flourished uh, in the United States. I'd been discouraged, uh, disillusioned a bit by the lack of uh, Congress and the President's ability to find ways to reduce spending and to balance the budget. And while I don't intend ever to walk away from those important issues, it became clear to me that another way that we can uh, reach a more balanced budget is to have a growing economy. And I started looking at research uh, that would uh, suggest how we get there. And uh, when Senator Wyden presented this uh, thought to me about engaging on this issue, uh, it was one that made so much sense to me, and I'm very grateful for the partnership that uh, we have developed. Uh, Senator Wyden and I, had, as he said, and indicated uh, that we would, had intended to speak this evening uh, about our concerns about the Protect IP Act pri prior to the bill being considered this week on the Senate floor. But because of the actions of millions of Americans uh, in voicing their concerns about this legislation, uh, we are... Uh, it is no longer necessary for us to throw uh, procedural obstacles in the way of the Protect IP Act, uh, and I appreciate uh, the Majority Leader withdrawing his plan to hold a vote tomorrow on this legislation. Last week's events, in which we all received so much um, input, uh, is a very good reminder of what a powerful tool the Internet can be. It was encouraging to see so many Americans get involved, particularly young Americans, who often choose not to be involved in the process, but they saw something important to them and they knew exactly how to communicate with elected officials. Uh, what became clear last week was that Congress uh, in this issue and its far-reaching implications were not fully yet understood. And so to take a pause, to take a step back and to reconsider the direction we were going seems so appropriate to me. Congress has the responsibility to remain engaged 
and up to speed on all issues, particularly those that so directly impact our economy. It is no easy task given that technology is constantly evolving, but it's an important task. Technology holds incredible promise from strengthening education to delivering health care more efficiently to allowing entrepreneurs to develop products that have yet to be invented. By remaining more engaged, Congress will also be better able to enact public policies that encourage Americans to innovate, create new products, and strengthen the economy. Last week's decision to delay consideration of PIPA was an important moment for many innovators and entrepreneurs across America, and it was an outcome that my colleagues and I, uh, Senator Wyden and others, sought to see occur. It's important also not just to entrepreneurs, but to people who are concerned about freedom and about the opportunity to use the Internet to communicate, uh, the, the opportunity for free speech, and certainly we had concerns about national security. My concerns about the Protect IP Act can be summed up like this. Certain provisions in this legislation will th threaten free speech, uh, innovation, and Internet, I I'm sorry, and, inter and our national security. I'm adamantly opposed to legislation that tampers with the Internet security, specifically the, the domain name system. Internet engineers have worked for 15 years to develop a way to authenticate the sites we visit to make sure they are secure and to enhance commerce on the Internet. At a time when our nation faces increasing numbers of cyber attacks from abroad, PIPA and SOPA would create significant security risks and set America back more than a decade. Second, both PIPA and SOPA would create new liabilities because of vague definitions in the bills that would drag companies into unnecessary and prolonged litigation. We don't need more legal battles. Congress should not put in place a system that would force law-abiding innovators to utilize their limited resources in the courtroom to defend themselves rather than invest in their companies, develop new products, and to hire new workers. America is a country of innovation that was founded on freedom and opportunity, and that's been true since the birth of our nation, when entrepreneurs have strengthened our country and its economy by creating new products and sharing them around the world. Americans today still want the opportunity to develop new products and to innovate in the marketplace. Because of the power of technology, ideas that were once only imaginable have now become a reality. About a year ago, Google announced that it was accepting applications from cities across the United States to deploy one gigabit internet connection, which is roughly a hundred times faster than what most users can experience today. Last March, much to my delight and the delight of many Kansans, Google chose Kansas City as the nation's first Google gigabit city. In fact, Kansas City was selected from more than 1,100 cities who had applied and competed. Many people in Kansas City, uh, in the Kansas City area, were soon asking what is actually possible with a gigabit internet connection. What happens when you connect an entire community with a gigabit internet connection? An organization called Think Big Partners wanted to know the answer to those questions. So they put together a competition called Gigabit Challenge. The Gigabit Challenge was a project based on an idea and a prediction. They predicted that when Americans are given access to cutting edge technology, in this case, one of the fastest bandwidths in the world, new innovations, new applications, and new products will be created. So they challenged entrepreneurs and innovators to come up with products that will leverage this new network capacity and offered significant cash prizes for the three best ideas. The response was overwhelming. 113 ideas were submitted from five co continents, seven countries, and 22 states. The list was eventually narrowed down to 17 companies who presented last week to a distinguished panel of judges. I had the opportunity to join Think Big Partners in Kansas City last week for part of that event, and I was impressed, so impressed by what I saw. And I congratulate the prize winners tonight who competed, and I congratulate all who competed and brought new ideas to the table. But the gigabit challenge underscores the fact that Americans want to innovate and Congress should encourage innovation rather than create new hurdles for American creators and innovators. One of the most important things Congress can do to encourage innovation is to make it easier for entrepreneurs to start a business. Last month, Senator Warner and I introduced bipartisan legislation called the Startup Act to jumpstart the economy through creation and growth of new businesses. 
Data from the Kauffman Foundation, the Kauffman Foundation in Kansas City shows that between 1980 and 2005, nearly all of the net jobs that were created in the United States were created by companies less than five years old. In fact, new businesses create about three million jobs each year. The Startup Act recognizes the job creating potential of entrepreneurs and is based upon five pro growth principles. First, the Startup Act will reduce the regulatory burden on new businesses and startups. New businesses, which are almost always small, face a tough challenge complying with the various rules and regulations that govern business behavior. According to the U.S. Small Business Administration, companies with fewer than 20 employees spend 36 percent more per employee than larger firms to comply with federal regulations. The president and CEO of the National Association for the Self-Employed, who endorsed the Startup Act, said this, the majority of small businesses are enterprises of one to two people. Cutting down on some of the unnecessary red tape that new businesses must face means that the owner can spend more time growing their business, hiring employees, and helping to turn our nation's economy back around. The Startup Act would help address these regulatory burdens faced by new companies. Reducing regulatory burdens mean entrepreneurs will have more time and money to invest in their business and to hire more workers. Secondly, the Startup Act creates tax incentives to help facilitate the financing of new businesses so they can get off the ground and grow more quickly. One of the greatest challenges for startups is accessing the necessary capital to grow their business. The Startup Act provides capital gains and income tax incentives to facilitate financing the new business at its critical juncture of firm growth. Helping entrepreneurs attract investment and retain greater share of the company's profits will lead to job growth. Third, the, the Startup Act recognizes innovation drives the American economy. Some of the best minds in the world work and study at American universities. The innovation that occurs on campuses across the nation contribute to the strength and vitality of our economy. To speed up the movement of new technologies to the marketplace where they can propel economic growth, the Startup Act uses a portion of existing federal research and development funding to support innovative projects at American universities in order to accelerate and improve the commercialization of cutting edge technologies developed through faculty research. When more good ideas make their way out of the laboratory and into the marketplace, more businesses and more jobs are created. Fourth, the Startup Act encourages pro-growth state and local policies through publications of reports on new business formation and entrepreneurial environments in states. I'm proud that Kansas City leaders recognize the importance of policies that support entrepreneurs. Last year, area leaders declared Kansas City should be called the America's most entrepreneurial city given their efforts to encourage entrepreneurship. Better policies at the state and local level will create more opportunities for more op entrepreneurs to open more businesses and to put more Americans to work. And finally, the Startup Act will help win the global battle for talent, keeping entrepreneurial minded and highly skilled workers in the United States. For too long, our nation's immigration policies have turned away American educated talent and sent highly skilled individuals back to their home country where they compete against America. Rather than lose that talent, we need to keep those highly skilled individuals and potential job creators in the United States. Our legislation recognizes the job creating potential of entrepreneurial and highly skilled immigrants and provides additional opportunities for those who are here legally on a temporary basis to stay if they have the high tech skills our economy needs or are willing to help and are able to create jobs for Americans. Highly skilled workers will fuel growth at technology startups and entrepreneurial immigrants will employ Americans. Business and industry leaders across the country are speaking out about the importance of innovation and entrepreneurship. Gary Shapiro, the president and CEO of the Consumer Electronics Association said this, as a country we must do more to support and foster innovation and entrepreneurialism and the introduction of the Startup Act is an important step forward. Dr. Robert Atkinson, the president and founder of the Information Technology and Information, I'm sorry, in Innovation Foundation, echoed those remarks. He said the United States is at risk of losing its economic leadership and vitality, and it is essential for policymakers to unite in practical ways to reverse this trend. The Startup Act is a commendable example of what is needed to restore U.S. innovation based competitiveness. The millions of Americans who spoke out last week against a bill that would stifle innovation on the internet understand the importance of this issue too. Fostering innovation and promoting entrepreneurship is not a Republican or Democrat idea. They are American values. 
What occurred last week is a reminder to all of us in this Senate about the leadership that's necessary. And again, I congratulate Senator Wyden for providing that leadership. And with good leaders in Washington, D.C., and with the American people who understand in many instances better than we often do the value of, of, of entrepreneurship upon free speech and open Internet, great things can once again happen in the United States of America. Our economy can flourish and grow. And it's, um, it's so important that what occurred this week with the legislation not proceeding sets the stage for greater opportunities for Americans across our country to have a dream, to pursue it, to succeed, to spend their time pursuing that dream. And in achieving their dreams, they have the opportunity to create success for others. I urge my colleagues to work with me. Let us work together. Our country cannot wait for after another election to get the economy growing again. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Texas. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I would like to join my colleague from Illinois in expressing our concerns about uh, the other, the junior senator from Illinois, Senator Kirk, who unfortunately suffered a medical incident, has had surgery, and is now recovering in Chicago. Um, we know uh, once again we're reminded that life is short and it's fragile, and uh, it could happen to any one of us or our families or anyone that we uh, care about and love. And uh, so uh, I know all of us extend our sympathy and our, uh, our uh, well wishes to uh, Senator Kirk as he begins his uh, convalescence and recovery from, this, uh, from his surgery and this uh, medical incident that he's uh, experienced. Mr. President, on another note, I'd like to observe that uh, tomorrow night the President of the United States will make his uh, annual State of the Union address to Congress. Uh, this signals, of course, the annual budget and appropriations process. But what has happened, what has not happened for too long, is the Senate passing a budget for the federal government. In fact, tomorrow, the same day the President will speak to the nation, it will be the thousandth day since the uh, budget was passed by the United States Senate. That day was April the 29th, 2009. And as the facts would reveal, uh, it's uh, our Democratic friends, uh, led by the Majority Leader Senator Reid, who have resisted bringing a budget to the floor for amendment and debate and a vote. I believe with all my heart, Mr. President, that's one of the reasons why the American people hold the Congress in such low regard, because we have failed in our most basic responsibilities now for more than a thousand days. None of us can imagine a family or a small business operating without a budget. It's just unthinkable. And I suspect there aren't many, if any, small businesses that don't sit down and do the hard work of working out a budget. A budget, after all, is a matter of priorities. As a distinguished occupant of the chair knows, as a former governor, uh, there's no way a state, a city, a county, a small business or a family can get by without a budget because it is the discipline that comes with a budget where you decide what is absolutely essential, you decide what you'd like to have that you maybe could put off for another day, and it forces you to reach the conclusion in some instances that things that you would like to do are simply unaffordable. But unfortunately, this, the majority leader has simply resisted uh, resisted uh, the, 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 those hard decisions, and uh, that's regrettable. As a member of the Budget Committee, I was especially disappointed that the Budget Committee, whose very purpose it is to uh, pass a budget, debate and pass a budget, didn't even debate one this last year. Uh, the Majority Leader, in, when asked about this in the press, said that it would be foolish for the majority to, pa to produce a budget. And I suspect he wanted to protect his Democratic members from some tough votes and tough decisions. But that's what we got sent here for, is to make hard decisions, but important decisions on behalf of our constituents and the American people, even if, it, even if they're tough votes and even if they're unpopular decisions, 
That's our responsibility. But under the leadership of uh, Senator Reid, the Senate has completely abdicated that responsibility for now a thousand, for a thousand days. But nothing could be more foolish or foolhardy than refusing to provide the nation's job creators, investors, and yes, the taxpayers with a blueprint for our fiscal future. How is it that the majority can continue to shrink from the most basic responsibilities of governing? You know, I'm amazed sometimes, Mr. President, people say they want to serve in, in public office. Uh, they like the, uh, you know, the prestige, perhaps, the visibility, the power that goes along with it. But yet when it comes to actually discharging their responsibilities and making tough decisions, they say, no, no, I don't want to make anybody mad. But that's what we got sent here for. That's our responsibility. And it's a plain fact that the American people cannot afford for this body to continue giving just mere lip service to fiscal sanity while seeing our a fiscal ship uh, so off keel. It should come as no surprise that during this period of time that we have not had a budget for the federal government, the nation has spent $9.4 trillion. $4.1 trillion has been added to the national debt, if you account for the fact that the President recently asked for another $1.2 trillion in additional borrowing authority. The national debt has grown to more than $15 trillion and is now larger than the whole U.S. economy, our gross domestic product. Government spending has reached a post-World War II record and now makes up 25 percent of the economy. That's just government spending alone. The, the, uh, the average has been somewhere around 20 percent of our gross domestic product. Now it's up to about 25 percent. Unfortunately, because the economy is so depressed, revenues are around 15 percent, hence a 10 percent annual budget deficit, which as it accumulates, add to our national debt. And as we all know, our nation has lost its AAA credit rating from Standard & Poor's, casting further doubt about the solvency of uh, the United States government and our commitment to pay our debts. All three major rating agencies have assigned a negative outlook, something short of a downgrade, but they've issued a warning to those who lend money to the, United States, uh, to the United States government that they have a negative outlook on the nation's long-term rating. This is a signal, too, that future downgrades are more likely in the near future. And you know what happens, Mr. President, when the, state, when the rating agencies downgrade our debt, it's more expensive for the federal government to borrow money. Indeed, uh, I've read that it's uh, over, over a 10-year period of time, a 1 percent increase in the cost of paying China or somebody to buy our debt in terms of a re uh, return on that investment, a 1 percent increase over 10 years is roughly $1.3 trillion. So even if we were to cut $1.3 trillion, just suffering a 1 percent increase in the cost of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of persuading somebody to buy our debt would, would negate and wipe out any savings by a cut. I fear that the, uh, that the failure to pass a budget is simply a recipe for more debt and more out-of-control spending. While the majority has abdicated its responsibility to pass a budget as required by law and even refused to bring it to the floor, the House has acted responsibly and has passed its own budget. But instead of offering their own blueprint in the Senate, the majority leader and the majority party have simply demagogued the House budget. We've seen that from the President of the United States. And, and, and ultimately, uh, Senator Reid brought the House budget up for a vote on the floor, knowing it would fail because it actually reduced spending, it continued much-needed tax relief, and it put the government on a diet, something the federal government sorely needs. The Senate also had an opportunity to finally vote on the budget submitted by the President last year. Now, this was something that was prompted by action of Senator McConnell, the uh, Republican leader, because our friends across the aisle didn't apparently even want to vote on the President's own proposed budget. But while there was support for the House budget, not one senator on either side of the aisle supported the President's budget. It went down 97 to 0, which was quite a remarkable vote. Even my colleagues on the other side of the aisle realized that the, that the budget submitted by the President was an irresponsible budget one that would increase taxes, increase spending, and increase debt. 
Mr. President, if we know that higher debt leads to slower economic growth. Economic studies have shown that high levels of government debt inhibit economic growth by creating economic uncertainty about the economy, about tax increases, and it actually crowds out or displaces investment in the private sector. And slower economic growth means fewer jobs. According to Christina Romer, former chair of the White House Council of Economic Advisors, a 1% change in gross domestic product growth is equivalent to 1 million jobs a year. I would uh, recall, Mr. President, back during uh, the administration proposed its stimulus uh, to try to get the economy moving again, $787 uh, uh, billion dollars plus interest, roughly a trillion dollars. They projected growth of the economy during 2011-2012 to be roughly 4.3 percent uh, of gross domestic product of 4.3 percent growth. Unfortunately, in the third quarter of 2010, which is the last quarter for which numbers are available, the economy grew at a rate of 1.8 percent. Not 4.3 percent, but 1.8 percent. So the warning sound has clearly been heard. The fiscal tsunami that many budget experts have predicted could suddenly arise is fast approaching. It's a challenge that faces the country today, not tomorrow, and we need solutions today. But it takes leadership and it takes courage. All we have to do is look across the Atlantic Ocean and watch many of our European friends, what they're going through today, to see what happens when government spending and debt are allowed to grow unchecked, when governments and nations live beyond their means and continue to rack up debt, passing it on to their children and grandchildren. At some point, the creditors of that nation, the holders of that sovereign debt, lose confidence in the ability of those nations to actually pay it back. And we see the kind of uh, sovereign debt crisis like we're seeing in Europe today. All of these challenges require presidential leadership. But I'm confident we won't hear the president talking about these issues tomorrow. The president has had multiple opportunities to embrace bipartisan uh, fiscal overhaul plans, such as the one produced by his own bipartisan debt commission, the Simpson-Bowles Commission. Unfortunately, the president has chosen to ignore the work of his own debt commission. Over the past few years, we've also uh, noted an explosion in the number of, fis of uh, federal regulations, which have further created uncertainty uh, in the economy and caused the entrepreneurs and job creators to sit on the sidelines, not knowing what the cost is going to be of their doing business, whether their business model will actually work, or whether, in addition to taxes, regulation, and the cost of health care, whether they can actually break even, much less make a profit. Well, it's no coincidence because of the higher debt, runaway regulations, and the threat of higher taxes that we've experienced the weakest economic recovery since World War II, leaving millions of Americans without jobs. My constituents, all 25 million of them in Texas, and everyone in America deserves better. And they are telling us in unequivocal terms that they think the country is on the right, on the wrong track. How could they possibly believe otherwise? My constituents understand that when Washington borrows 40 cents out of every dollar it spends and knows the national debt is a job-killing economic liability for the country, how would they say the country is on the right track when clearly it's not? Every man, woman, and child in my state and across the country owes roughly $49,000 in debt, and that's increased by almost 40 percent since President Obama took office in 2009. The unemployment rate in Texas, while thankfully, gratefully, is lower than the, the national rate, it consistently remains above what it was since the last time the Senate passed a budget. The unemployment rate in Texas is 20 percent higher than it was when the administration told Texans that its stimulus plan would make sure the national rate would not go above 8 percent. Well, if you even if you go back and look at the projections, they said it wouldn't go above 8 percent, and by the first quarter in 2012, it'd be 6 percent. Clearly, they were off the mark, and the stimulus failed to meet the administration's own stated goals. My constituents also believe 
with some justification that the national debt is a national security risk. Admiral Mike Mullen, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has said that the debt is the single biggest threat to our national security. Now, when he said that, that struck me as unusual to have here the uh, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, saying that it is our financial uh, condition that is our national threat, uh, national security threat. But when you think about it, if America can't pay our debt back, if we experience a sovereign debt crisis, if the interest demanded by our creditors goes through the roof, as we've seen for Italian bonds and other bonds over in Europe, it means that we won't have the money to pay not only for the safety net programs that are important for the most vulnerable of Americans and keep our commitments for Social Security and Medicare, it means we won't be able to protect the national security of the United States, which is the number one responsibility of the federal government. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has said that the debt, quote, undermines our capacity to act in our own interest, and it also sends a message of weakness internationally. My constituents know that successful debt reduction measures must rely on spending cuts, not tax increases, and that they, economic growth is one of the main goals. Right now, if we don't... Uh, act before the end of the year due to expiring tax provisions, we'll see the single highest tax bill in American history, almost $5 trillion more by some estimates. For example, the state and local uh, tax, sales tax deduction, my state doesn't have an income tax, and income taxes are deductible under federal tax law, but state income, state uh, taxes, sales taxes are not uh, right now, but for the provision that will, uh, will uh, expire by the end of the year. This is an important issue to my constituents and a matter of fundamental fairness. In 2009, 2.1 million taxpayers in Texas claimed almost $4 billion in deductions. And according to Texas Comptroller Susan Combs, extending the sales tax deduction will benefit millions of Texans who work hard to keep our nation's economy vibrant. And I'm proud, Mr. Mr. President, that my state has been really a, a beacon from an economic standpoint of opportunity where people have voted with their feet and they've moved from places where they don't have jobs and don't have opportunities to places like Texas where they do. And it's no uh, coincidence that as a result of the most recent reapportionment, Texas got four new congressional uh, seats in the reapportionment, primarily because people are moving to where the opportunity is. It makes perfect sense. So why would we want to do anything that would threaten the uh, economy of Texas or any other state in the Union for that matter? We know the President will give another speech to the American people tomorrow night, and he'll send his budget as required by law to Congress early next month. And at this time, the American people will be able to see for themselves if we have a leader that possesses the audacity uh, to bring us together uh, to right the ship, or one who will lead us down a path that's brought the economies of Europe to the brink of economic disaster at a permanent lower standard of living. Mr. President, I yield the floor. Senator from Minnesota. Uh, Mr. President, I ask to speak as if in morning business for two minutes. Without objection. Uh, Mr. President, uh, we are about to pass unanimously a bridge uh, that a St. Croix bridge bill, something we have been working on very hard, uh, the two senators from Minnesota, uh, myself, Senator Franken, and Senator Johnson, as well as Senator Cole, to get through the United States Senate. This bridge uh, bill allows a bridge to move forward that has been awaiting uh, being built for 30 years. Uh, it is a bridge uh, that exists now uh, that is a beautiful bridge, uh, but it is falling apart. Uh, pieces of the bridge has fallen into the St. Croix River. Uh, it is a bridge that is expected to take 18,000 cars a day and the Department of Transportation of the state of Minnesota believes very strongly that we need a new bridge. Uh, what this legislation does is allows the bridge to move forward. I appreciate all 
uh, the help from my colleagues on both sides of the aisle. Uh, they have helped me to uh, work on this legislation over the last few months. Uh, Senator Coburn had some changes at the end, um, and uh, we worked with every single senator to get this done. The bill now moves to the House, where it also enjoys bipartisan support, and both governors of both states support this bill, and they will then be allowed to build the bridge uh, that they want to build. Uh, there has been questions raised about whether this creates some kind of a precedent under the Scenic Rivers Act. This is a very unique situation. It has taken us a year to pass this. Uh, we are in a situation where any new bridge would need an exemption to the Scenic Rivers Act. Uh, so we're pleased that this bill is getting passed today. I don't think anyone believed we could have done this unanimously after 30 years of work, but tonight we're getting it done. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Illinois. I ask unanimous consent the Homeland and Government Affairs Committee be discharged from further consideration <clears throat> excuse me, of H.R. 3237 and the Senate proceed to its immediate consideration. Clerk will report. H.R. 3237, an act to amend the SOAR Act by clarifying the scope of coverage of the act. Is there objection to proceeding to the major? Without objection. I ask unanimous consent the bill will be read a third time and passed. The motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. And any statements related to the bill be placed in the record at the appropriate places if read. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to consideration of calendar number 264, S. 1130. The Senator suspend. That the pre previous uh, message is discharged from the Health Committee rather than Homeland. Mr. President, I'd like to amend my earlier remarks to reflect the Health Committee as opposed to the Homeland and Government Affairs Committee uh -huh. relative to H.R. 3237. Without objection. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to consideration of calendar number 264, S. 1134. Okay. Clerk will report. Calendar number 264 F1134, a bill to authorize the St. Croix River Crossing Project with appropriate mitigation measures to promote river values. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection, the Senate will proceed. I ask unanimous consent that any reported amendment be agreed to and be considered original text for the purposes of <clears throat> further amendment that the Klobuchar, Johnson of Wisconsin, Franken amendment, which is at the desk, be agreed to. The bill is amended, be read a third time and passed. The motions to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate, and any statements related to the bill be placed in the record at the appropriate places if read. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to consideration of H. Con Res 96, which was received from the House and is at the desk, that the concurrent resolution be agreed to and the motion to reconsider be laid upon the table with no intervening action or debate. Objection. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the appointment at the desk appear separately in the record as if made by the chair. Objection. I ask unanimous consent that when the Senate completes its business today, the Senate adjourn until 10 a.m. on Tuesday, January 24th, 2012. But following the prayer and pledge, the journal of proceedings be approved to date, the morning hour be deemed expired, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. With the following, any leader remarks, the Senate be in a period of morning business until 4 p.m., with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each, with the time equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees with the first 30 minutes, controlled by the majority leader or his designee, and the second 30 minutes controlled by the Republican leader or his designee. And then at 12.30 p.m., the Senate be in recess until 2.15 p.m. to allow for the weekly caucus meeting. Without objection. If there's no further business to come before the Senate, I ask that it adjourn under the previous order. Since then, adjourns until 10 a.m. tomorrow. Today, the Senate confirmed John Gerard to be a U.S. District Judge for Nebraska.